This is the American Empire Element 3 Part 2, and here I wanted to focus specifically on the foreign policy of Theodore Roosevelt during his two terms as President of the United States from 1901 to 1909. Now, if you remember, Teddy Roosevelt was an assistant secretary of the Navy who went over his boss's head and went over President McKinley's head to order Commodore George Dewey to attack the Philippines a month and a half before war was declared on Spain. So he's obviously aggressive and ambitious. You might also remember that he formed his own regiment in the Spanish-American War, bought his own uniforms, and just seemed to really enjoy being in the war. He liked being aggressive. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with the picture on this slide here. The picture on this slide is of the Panama Canal, which was a direct effect of the Spanish-American War. And as you can take a close look at this, you'll see it's very impressive. Now, since the global naval race had begun in the 1800s, everybody had been interested in putting a canal somewhere in Central America. Well, that site eventually was decided on as Panama, and it was direly needed. If you take a look at this chart up here, this part of the map, you'll notice that, uh, let's say, a U.S. ship that was in the Pacific or uh, on the Pacific coast near Colombia, let's say even, would have to take about two weeks to go around South America just to get to the Caribbean. If you were going from San Francisco to New York, that would be about 13,000 miles. That same trip, if you were going through a canal zone, would be about 5,200 miles. So uh, a, a canal was needed for... Uh, not just our Navy, but any Navy, uh, to go, instead of going around South America, to go through a canal to get to the Caribbean. Uh, anybody would want to be in charge of this, and we wanted to be at the forefront of it. Now, uh, the hay Ponsafote Tre Treaty of 1901 gave the U.S. exclusive rights to build the Panama Canal. The problem was, at that time, Panama was still part of Colombia whose government was not going to allow it. So we did what we do. We disregarded international law and all the protests of the Colombians and any precedent that had been set before us. And we helped Panama rebel against Colombia in 1903. They got their independence, and we got to build the Panama Canal after getting permission from the brand new independent country of Panama. Now, to be fair, it wasn't totally our fault. We were going to buy what a French canal company had already left behind there for about $40 million. Now, the French wanted their $40 million. They were just looking to break even on the deal. $40 million was what they originally had invested. They weren't looking to make a profit. They were just looking to get out of it without losing anything. So they led the revolt. It was in their best interest as well if Panama became independent because then we'd build the canal and pay the French for the things they'd already left behind there. So the French led the revolt. Uh, we just kept the Colombian forces from coming in and stopping it from happening. In any event, this was going to be a massive project. Even using modern-day equipment, it's obviously kind of a big mess when you're trying to do construction on the canal. But using equipment from 1903, uh, not anywhere near as easy. And when the construction began in 1904, we had to fight labor problems and especially malaria. Lots of, lots of guys, a lot of workers got sick from malaria. But the canal was eventually completed in 1914, just before World War I. And if you actually stop and pause this video and analyze this, this is a major, major accomplishment when you take a look at uh, uh, the different lakes and the locks that are involved down here and all the things that had to happen and take place uh, for this to even be a reality. It's amazing. It's a, it's a world wonder. But even after the canal, we kept spreading our influence in Latin America most notably with the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Now remember, the Monroe Doctrine had said that uh, European nations were to stay on their side of the ocean and stay out of the Western Hemisphere and stay out of U.S. business and stay out of Latin American business. Well, 
it was going to be kind of hard to do because they had a fairly good argument. See, in the late ni- eight, or by 1900, I should say, Latin American nations owed money to European governments. Now, Teddy Roosevelt feared that the Europeans would become too involved in Latin American affairs, which would get their foot in the door as bill collectors. Uh, this would be a flagrant violation of the Monroe Doctrine. They were supposed to stay on their side of the ocean on matters. But the European governments could justify it. I mean, they were entitled to their money. So Teddy Roosevelt decided to do something very aggressive, as always. The U.S. would pay off Latin American debts to the Europeans. All of them. They would pay them off completely so that the Europeans could just go away with their money. This is what is known as the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. In other words, we will pay off their debts so that you, the Europeans, are paid off. And then they can owe us forever. You guys can go away, and they will owe us the money because somebody's got to pay us back. I mean, we're the ones paying off the loan. So the Europeans can go away, and Latin America is now indebted to us. So in other words, we get to push them around about their debts. You stay on your side of the ocean, as per the Monroe Doctrine. Latin America, of course, hated the Roosevelt Corollary. We were now officially the bad neighbor, and the Caribbean was being referred to as a Yankee Lake, patrolled by U.S. Marines. For Latin America, the Monroe Doctrine had been a shield to protect them from European invasion. The Roosevelt Corollary was now a weapon being used against them. Since the United States had paid off their debts to Europe, Now, Latin America owed the United States forever, and U.S. forces would continue to get involved in Latin American affairs because they could simply argue it was protecting American interests, the Caribbean's ability to pay off their debts. There were some other notable aspects of Teddy Roosevelt's foreign policy that did not involve the Caribbean. First was the Portsmouth Conference of 1905, Uh, Russia and Japan had gone to war in 1904. Teddy Roosevelt had been approached to conduct peace negotiations, so both sides were invited to meet in, of all places, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to talk. Now, a little town in New Hampshire seems like an odd place for the Japanese and the Russians to meet to settle a war that they were in on the other side of the world, But they did come to Portsmouth, and they did talk it out, and they eventually did reach peace with a little help from Teddy Roosevelt. Sounds pretty good so far. Except that the treaty didn't satisfy either side, most notably Japan, who felt like it had actually won the war and was waiting for concessions to be given to them. This basically soured United States relations with both nations, Russia and Japan. But... At least Teddy Roosevelt got a Nobel Peace Prize for it. That was nice. And after the Portsmouth Conference, many Japanese began immigrating to the United States. This is the first step of the Root Takahira Agreement of 1908. Now, the story behind that basically begins like this. In 1906, right after a major earthquake, San Francisco's school board orders Asian students into a special school to make more room for whites. Now, this pretty much immediately turned into an international crisis. There was actually talk of war between the United States and Japan over it, over this this one issue in San Francisco after a major earthquake. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, though, once again makes a very aggressive move. He gets together with the Japanese and, in secret, Uh, conducts a gentleman's agreement with them. Uh, The order to uh, make Asian students go into a special school to make more room for whites will be repealed as long as the Japanese agree to send no more Japanese laborers to the United States. Now, this was uh, a sketchy move by both sides. They basically sold their own people out. But uh, the order was secretly agreed on, and they avoided war that way. The problem was that Teddy Roosevelt thought that this made him look weak, 
and therefore he sends the great white fleet out. Now, of course, Teddy Roosevelt was never known to take a soft stand on anything, so in order to make sure that this secret gentleman's agreement didn't make him look weak, he sends out the great white fleet to basically show off. Uh, they were 16 warships that visited different countries around the world, essentially just to show American might and send a message, specifically to Japan when they stopped there. Overall, the Great White Fleet covered about 42,000 miles, and it was really done for no other reason than to just show off American military might. It was just meant to impress everybody in the world. And it seemed to work. Because in 1908, three years after the Portsmouth Conference and two years after the earthquake in San Francisco, the Rut Takahira Agreement was signed. The U.S. and Japan will respect each other's territorial possessions and uphold the open-door policy with China so they can both freely trade there. It was seen as a, a, major, uh, a major solidifying factor of Teddy Roosevelt's foreign policy. Okay, that's it for the American Empire. Thanks for listening.